Welcome to Waiatea Fifth Estate, brought to you by Voyager Internet, independently tested by TrueNet as New Zealand's fastest ISP for home and business fibre internet connections. Call them on 0800 4 speed for $69 unlimited internet per month. Kia ora welcome to YTF for the State, where we wrap the most important news events with the best political panel on television. Joining us tonight for our infamous Friday night political wrap of the week, in studio, former leader of the Labour Party, People's Hero David Cunliffe, chairman of the Otara Papatoitoi local board of Fesso Collins, the youngest mayoral candidate in the Auckland mayoralty race, Chloe Swarbrick, and political commentator, author and blogger Chris Trotter. Thank you for joining us, panel. Remember, viewers, you can send in questions and thoughts in tonight's show off the watianews.com and the dailyblog.nz platforms, or you can email us on w5e at facetv.co.nz. NZ. Tonight's guest Twitter commentators are Kate Davis, Sparis, Sparis Palestine, Sarah B, Karen Foreman Brown. Follow them tonight using the hashtag Watia Fifth Estate. The top three issues of the week tonight are issue one, mass surveillance powers. Why it's such a huge erosion of civil liberties. Issue two, what is happening to our drinking water and is intensive farming to blame. And issue three, how Orwellian does the Ministry of Vulnerable Children sound? Plus, we'll wrap the show with a final word from our panellists. Well, let's get stuck into issue one. Yesterday in Parliament, the government read through the first reading to give the GCSB even more spying powers. Under the proposed new law, the GCSB will be able to conduct their own investigations under a warrant system which still allows the 24-hour warrantless surveillance and threatens whistleblowers highlighting illegal government leaks with five years in prison are you feeling safe yet david the secret intelligence service colluded with the prime minister's office months before the 2011 election to falsely smear the leader of the opposition phil goff if the state intelligence apparatus is prepared to manipulate the democratic process and smear leaders of other parties to impact elections then how can the rest of us trust these buggers well, you design a system which has sufficient oversight so that it doesn't work on trust. Yeah. Now, um, nobody, I don't think, in the Labour Party thinks the government's draft is perfect. Yep. We do think there's a need for it. We yep. supported it to select committee so we can go through it line by line by line, and this is going to be an Andrew Little call. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Having said that, we know that there's some issues. We know that the definitions are too broad. They could We know that anything. the protections in some cases are better but in some cases don't go far enough. Yep. One good thing about it is that the role of the Inspector General has been beefed up. Yep. That was crucial in that case that you're talking about. Yep. That should never have happened. Of course, Warren <laughs> Tucker had to resign. I'm yes. not resign, but apologise. That's right. I have a reasonable degree of confidence in the current director. Yes. I don't think that would happen today. Yes. But as I said, you don't design a system to be based on trust. You base it on tight law and tight oversight. Um, the five years for whistleblowers, come on. Um, um, oh, that will have to be looked at by the select committee seems uh, too hard for me. Yes. But uh, let's also say we need those definitions tightened right down. So when you when you cross a, a Rubicon yep. to have surveillance on domestics, yep. and if you allow the possibility that that can be warrantless yep. in extreme circumstances, the definition of extreme has to be watertight mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the protections have to be robust. Now if, there are threats out there, yep. there is good reason for doing this. Yep. We do want to see the membership of the Security Oversight Committee expanded yep. uh, and all of those are reasonable things. There is a point we can get to I think which will work but sure as hell the National Party hasn't got us there yet. Um, a journalist revealing the government illegally spying under this law would be looking at five years in prison. That that just that can't that can't. Fact-based fact journalism, in my view, is a pillar of a free and open society. Yep. And journalists must always be free to criticise the government of the day. That is in the nature of democracy. That will have to be looked at in a select committee. Chris, the seismic change here is that the law rammed through by national misusing urgency last time allowed the GCSB to operate as technical support to selected law enforcement agencies who were involved with live cases. This new law allows the GCSB to start their own investigation. Should we be afraid of a spy agency out of control? Well, I think what you've got to understand is that 
all this is happening, all this is being driven by an exponential rise in um, cyber uh, warfare. Yep, yep. yep. Um, and cyber crime, you're quite right. Now, um, one of the world's um, most adept uh, nations when it comes to um, cyber espionage is um, the People's Republic of China. Yes. Our first or second largest economic partner, depending on how the dairy prices are yep. going. <laughs> So the government is going to be reluctant, shall we say, to identify the Chinese as the prime reason for the changes in legislation. They prefer to blame it on um, radical Islam yes. or some such bogeyman. But that's the real reason. That's why this has been reshaped the way it has. It's to combat um, cybercrime and cyber espionage, to which New Zealand companies both large and small, particularly the small and innovative, are becoming more and more vulnerable. So that's the, that's the backstory to this. Um, and all over the world, these kind of agencies, these security services, are gearing up for this because it's happening more and more frequently. But surely if there are these problems, you go through the domestic uh, uh, security apparatus, the police, your, your, your terrorist groups, what have you, and if they need the technical support under the current legislation, they apply to the GCSB, the GCSB looks into it for them. Do you trust the GCSB themselves investigating? Well, do you trust the deep state? That's what you're really asking me, uh, Bomber. And uh, no, I don't. But whether I trust it or not makes not one whit of let difference. Me, let, me, let me look at uh, budgets here. The 2014 to 2015 budget for the GCSB, and we got the, the numbers off the government today, was 86,843,000. Their budget for 2015 to 2016 is 143 million 568,000. That's almost a 60 million dollar increase in one year. Absolutely. What other government department Absolutely. gets a 75% increase? But as I said, um, the incidence of um, cyber warfare, um, to give it its you know most general uh, name, has risen to such an extent. I mean, it's gone from I think it was probably less than 100 um, instances yep, of yep, which the yep, government yep. became aware, up to several hundred right. now, in the space of just a year or so. Yeah, yep, yep. Uh, and it shows no signs of declining. Now, whether you um, are going to put the burden of investigation and interception on the shoulders of the police or leave it to these guys, I mean, that's a fair point. But th these guys are getting better and better at this, um, and they've been called upon to do it more and more. Well, it, are they getting better and better? Because they don't seem to have caught many. A fesso, this is, there is well, something. Well, you don't know. Well, we don't know what exactly, <laughs> because it never turns out, does it? A fesso, there is something deeply racist, isn't there, at play here, with John Key consistently claiming Islamic radicals are here, seeing as more New Zealanders have been harmed by unclean drinking water, water <laughs> than have been killed by ISIS, should we be um, spying on farmers? Using the same logic. Using the same logic, should we be spying on farmers? Well, let's hope that they do spend some time spying on farmers if we're going to use that logic. Look, I think it's th this is a, a government that's just running the rhetoric and running the psyche that we should be fearful. Right. Uh, and so what they're trying to do is they get the fear factor going right throughout the nation because it then it makes people want to have more spying. It makes us feel safer that we've got more CCTV cameras all in shopping centres, for crying out loud. And so that's what they're trying to do mm. is when you start feeding the, the national psyche that there's something to be afraid of and we can pull on that, we can go off and use ISIS as examples and radical Islamic people then that's going to create the necessary fear to push this kind of law through. Yeah. Um, information released to FESO under the Official Information Act earlier this year showed complaint after complaint after complaint of sexist and racist jokes inside the GCSB aimed towards the people they were spying on. Can Māori and Pacifica people trust a GCSB that is rife with racism? No, I don't think we can trace, trust that institution. I think there's a number of government institutions that we can't trust. And I think what we're seeing now is specific people, even Māori people, say, look at what happened at Uruwera. Hey, they were saying, oh, well, we're having a look that's into right, this case right, because right. they, they were terrorists as well. And we learned from the court cases that wasn't the case at all. So I think we, we're creating this fear within the country so that we can, in fact, push these laws 
through and it just means that the government get away with looking into everybody. Uh, Chloe, there's more danger from cow shit in our water than ISIS. Are we being conned into granting powers to a threat that hasn't actually manifested? Well, I think that David actually pointed to something which is quite important here is that we do need these legislative checks and balances Absolutely. and this is something Absolutely. that I've been concerned yeah. about ever since I was in law school and working as a journalist. I actually interviewed Glenn Greenwald when he was here for Kim.com's yep. Big Revelations uh, yep. in 2014. Uh, what I think that we actually really need as New Zealanders right now is to strengthen our constitution. So in our Bill of Rights we've got section 4 which stipulates that any piece of legislation which overrides our Bill of Rights does override our Bill yeah, of Rights. We right, have no right. protections whatsoever. Yeah. So what I think we really need is a codified Supreme Constitution. Um, as a candidate interested in politics, are you concerned that government agencies are rifling through your online information? Personally, uh, I'm not. Uh, everything that I do have is out there, but I do disagree with the argument that if you've got nothing to hide, etc. Yeah. Uh, but no, I'm not, and I don't think that we're going to see anything like the DNC's whole rigging of the situation. Thank you, panel. We need to move on to issue two, and suddenly New Zealand has a major crisis with drinking water. Havelock North, Water in Christchurch and other provincial uh, centres are finding their water poisoned by what many are claiming are the results of dairy intensification. David, environmentalists have been warning us for a very long time that this dairy intensification could have a major impact on our clean water supply. Are we reaping what we sow here? Well, we certainly put too many cars in one basket. Before we leap to the conclusion, though, I have heard an alternative story that yep. may have been a piggery upstream of the aquifer. It doesn't really matter. The story's the same, which is our aquifers are really, really precious. Mm, mm. They get into our bores. Uh, the insane proposal in Ashburton to uh, sell billions of litres of water at a almost gratis price mm, mm. Uh, carried with it the liability on the Ashburton District Council to guarantee the purity of the water and of course it's in the middle of a dairy irrigation scheme that would have been a risk that no uh, sane council should have taken so under public pressure that fell over and um, that's a counterexample. What worries me with this case not only did it happen but it took almost a week after people yeah. started getting sick yeah. that had got notified yeah. and we yeah. have had thousands and thousands of people desperately ill I mean and and allegedly a death yeah um, this should not happen and I think our response or the government's response to it has been woefully slow 4,000 New Zealanders it's are sick almost as, as today. unheard of almost unheard have you of. have you ever seen anything in politics like this I've never seen anything like it as a public health emergency yeah. Uh, and it really begs the question, how could the infrastructure have been that bad? And of course the irony was a water tanker which was sent to a school oh, was also oh, infected I think with E. coli, a different right, bug. But right. you get two separate infestations in one district at one time. There's something wrong with the monitoring systems that shouldn't be allowed to happen because it should be picked up. It's a system failure. Chris, uh, this issue is mana from heaven for the Greens, isn't it? I mean this is, this is to the Greens what the housing crisis is for Labour. <laughs> Well, it's it's mana what you mana if, yeah. mana for mana if those are around. It's it's what you can expect, um, as as David says, uh, when you um, increase the number of stock on the same area of land to the extent we have, particularly with cattle. Mm. I mean, a dairy farm used to be a going concern with a herd of about a hundred cows okay. fifty years ago. Um, six to eight hundred cows is what you need wow. now. You put that many cows on essentially the same area, yeah. the, the intensification is, is huge. I mean, that's why they have to import palm kernels and all this sort of stuff, because the land simply can't sustain that sure. many cows without artificial um, assistance from the farmer. Um, and this is going to impact um, on the groundwater, yeah. uh, particularly if you have an extreme weather event, as occurred in the Hawke's Bay around Havelock North, uh, and it, it washes through and these contaminants get caught up. Now, um, a, a, a city like Hastings, a, a town like Havelock North, has been able to rely on bores, just go straight down into yep. pure water, water that's been sitting there for thousands of years, absolutely pure, beautiful water to drink, no foul taste of chlorine you know, on, on your tongue, but if it gets contaminated, you're in real trouble because until now, you haven't needed to treat it. Mm. And, and sadly, it may, it may be one of the upshots 
of this um, whole crisis that everywhere people are forced to treat their water. How hard will Fonterra and Federated Farmers be working behind the scenes to ensure it's not traced back to their industry? <laughs> well, right now, cows are being oh. just killed. Right now. Horses I mean, being found in cows here. It's going to be uh, a real test <laughs> yeah. of the integrity of uh, whoever's given the job of investigating this whole um, crisis um, as, as to the nature of the report that emerges. Uh, because if it's a whitewash, if it's, oh, nothing to see here, folks, move on. I mean, that that will be a 4,000 sick probably. people, yeah. does, uh, that's right. I mean, Quite. I think Labour today said, this has got to be extended across the whole yeah. of New Zealand. Yeah. It's not, if they just focus on Havelock North, that's not good Missing enough. the point. Mm. Chloe, uh, real criticism levelled at the Havelock North's local council for not moving sooner on this. When do you think a council must inform people of a problem? What, what, what do you think the time... At the point at which someone must... Uh, well, I think that as soon as it's identified as a real problem, as a yeah. real health issue, absolutely. What this identifies, this crisis in particular, is that uh, responsibility needs to be taken at all points, not just when there is a crisis, but taking the lead on environmental issues as well. Um, does this, do you think, damage our clean green image? <laughs> if it hasn't been damaged enough already. Uh, Fesso, you are chairman of the Otara Papatoto board. How do you ensure strong communication links with your community and how would you have handled this? Yeah, well, I think we've got to know that it's happened. I th I'm with David on this. I think it was far too slow for the council yeah. to respond. Once you identify it, people have to know. And You, you know, you don't have 10,000 people behind you in a council, say, for Auckland, only to fail in communicating this kind of information. So mm. I think we've got to be able to respond better. You've got the expertise around you, so you should know these things, and that's the way you get out, uh, you get the information in front of you. But then you have a communication system. These, we pay people thousands of dollars who are our comms experts. They should be out there knowing how to connect with the community, mm. and they failed on this occasion. Good point. Thank you, panel. We need to move on to issue three. So. The government have restructured SIFs and called it the Ministry of Vulnerable Children, which sounds all willy -in. Is it a ministry that creates vulnerable children? I don't know. The latest shocking report found children in state care, in state care, were more likely to be abused than if they were left in the community. David, the issue is severe underfunding. National's response is an ideological private contractor's charter. How on earth... Does the market fix damaged and hurt children? Well, n nothing could be harder by the time it gets to that. But I, I'm glad you picked this topic because it sounds innocuous, but I think it's the pointy end of a very deep shift that's going on. Yeah. Because by saying it's only some children we care about, the most vulnerable, and you keep defining that as a smaller and smaller group, you make it somebody else's problem. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. then you undermine the public mandate for action because it's about them, not about all of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's part of a trend in this government and in neoliberalism worldwide to use targeting and now data to shrink the ambit of the protective action of the state to the point where it can become able to be privatised and ultimately irrelevant. Yeah. It's a very dangerous trend. Uh, we are opposing, Labour is opposing <laughs> yeah. this change vociferously and Jacinda Ardern's doing a great job yes, yeah. uh, on it. And we need to ram this home and people need to understand this is a very, very thin end of a very, how, very big wedge. How is it that, you know, bless you politicians and all, but 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 it seems to me, especially we particularly under, 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 under National, they've done this amazing job of just, oh, that's not our responsibility anymore. Yep. Social housing, nah! Children, well, remember, children who were who in danger. Remember in the <laughs> days when a prime minister would sack ministers for telling lies. Yeah. Now it's almost compulsory. It's in just it's just what you have to do, right? Yeah, well, Helen Clark, the day. I'm ask her. Um, Chris, <laughs> this is the fourteenth time now that SIFS has been restructured. Fourteen times. Why will the fifteenth be the charm? Well, I think I mean just to wind it back a bit. Um, at the, at the base of this is actually an extraordinary New Zealand study. This is the longitudinal study yes. begun in Dunedin yes. Yes. back in the early 1970s. And all around the world, people are looking at the results of this study. And one of the things that has emerged is an ability to find down and identify those most likely to need help 
throughout their lives. Mm. Now, this is something that Bill English has picked up on. This is something um, uh, that Anne Tolley is running with. Um, and that's, that's, that's the direction. That's, yeah. what's, that's yeah. what's behind this, um, this whole new exercise, the Ministry for Vulnerable Children. They really do believe that they can identify the kids most in need of help, wrap the help around them, and in a sense, short circuit, you know, the, the, the genetic engineering. Um, now, whether that turns out to be possible um, without turning into a minority report, the science fiction movie where, where they arrested you before you committed the crime. Which um, kind of sounds like uh, uh, Ministry, of, well, <laughs> Ministry of Social Development. Yeah, so, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge gamble on Nationals' part, but there's something in it um, that I, I think it would be wrong to simply dismiss out of hand. Because if you can identify those most at risk, if you can surround them with the support they need, the results will be spectacular. Because these people cost society thousands and thousands of dollars. And you know, particularly those who go on to criminal um, activity, um, they can take lives, they can ruin lives, they can be imprisoned at a cost of $100,000 a year. So this is the argument that, that that English makes. Spend the money now far less than you'll have to spend overall um, if you if you don't take this approach. So there's you know, there's something in it that that You're that being remarkably kind this evening and it disappoints me. It disappoints me, Chris. <laughs> uh, Chloe, who should be responsibility uh, would be responsible for children from broken homes? Should it be the government? Or is it the family's responsibility? Well, by and large, the children who are entering these systems don't have that support network. And mm. why we're focusing on children is because that is that is a place where we can instigate and we can actually make changes in their lives and we can get them off that, that pathway, that cycle of criminality, yeah. that cycle of poverty, etc. So it is definitely a place where the government should be intervening because it does mitigate costs in the future. But foremost, it's an ethical thing. As a society, we should be looking after our most vulnerable, although I would disagree with the name change. Um, goodness, we need you in, in, in local <laughs> politics and national politics. Forget the Auckland, Auckland mayoralty. Uh, Feso, what, what should this ministry be called? Look, I think Judge Andrew B. Croft is right here. Oranga Tamariki is yep. the way to go. Yep. This is yep. about yep. dealing yep. with the wellness of our yep. young people. But yep. Yep. let's look, in the main, we are talking about Māori and mm. Pacific Island families. Mm. That's what it comes back to. Mm. That, we don't need data to prove that. And we know that it's those communities, it's Māori Pacific and it's South Auckland, Porirua yep. pick up part of the hut. Those are the families that are most affected. Those are the families we're concentrating on. And the driver here is poverty. We've got yeah. families who are earning well under the minimum wage if, who can't get if by. There is, hey. If there is an element of cynicism in this, it lies in the fact that they are doing everything to address the problem, except eliminate poverty. Right, which is the yeah. prime generator right. of the That's problem. That's right. That's that is right. one thing National will never do. Yeah. Fiso, what do we need to do? On this? Yeah, well, and see, the re what, what it does is when you restructure, you get a whole lot of consultants. The, money, the government loves giving money to consultants because yeah. rebranding means, oh, vulnerable children. Suddenly a national government cares about people. That's what the driver is yeah, here. Yeah, so yeah, we're not yeah, dealing yeah. to poverty. We're not dealing to the real hardship that's being faced out south. Mm -hmm. And that's why we come up with name changes because that makes us feel better when we know it's going to make no difference whatsoever. Well, we need you in politics too. Ah, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we, need, we have to wrap the show. Before we go, a final word from our guest. Professor, your final word this week. Look, a vote for, well, it's local government politics yes. on at the moment. Our message to our people is a vote for Auckland Future, is a vote for National. Make sure they tick Labour and City Vision. Excellent. Chris, your final word. I would just like to throw a very large brick bat at the people who thought it was a good idea to commemorate the Battle of Long Tan. Oh, yeah. There is nothing about our country's involvement in the Vietnam War which is worthy of commemoration, let alone celebration. No, that's a great, excellent point. Chloe, your final word this week? Well, we've seen uh, highlighted this week in politics and in the news that there are issues with our environment. We are progressing in the world of technology and we do need those safeguards, those checks and balances. So what we really need to do is vote for leaders that are able to comprehend and plan for the future. 
So I would recommend that people do go along to my website, chloeforauckland.co.nz, and follow what I'm up to in this election. Finally, we've got a, uh, a real competition on our hands. Phil Goff may not get this. Uh, David, your, your final word this week? Look, at the risk of being on message, which, you know, I don't always All do. <laughs> hey, um, it's still, for me, it's still housing, housing and housing, yeah. because as a local MP, I'm just, I'm confronted not only with people who can't get a roof over their head, I remember the day I first found a family living in a garage. It was like a national emergency. We had them out of there in a week. Now you can't find a garage in South Auckland that's got a damn car in it because yeah. they're all full of families. That's not okay. Let's not take our eye off that ball. And it will be the thing that flips middle New Zealand away from this government because it's not rocket science to know what to do. You just have to break a few investor eggs to make the omelette. How horrified were you, David, uh, this week, uh, news out west that, that people are now begging to pay to park their cars in people's driveways to sleep in the cars? I mean, it people are looking not, to rent driveways for God's sakes. It is not sex. New Zealand, and we must never accept mm. that our society can be so broken that any person, any child, any family would have to take refuge in a car it is unacceptable. It will not be tolerated under a new left-leaning government. And Amen. We can't uh, change it without changing the government, though. Uh, we've they still got 12 more months. The market, though. <laughs> Don't they? <laughs> Thank you, panel, and to my, fi my final word uh, this week, the New Zealand Herald <laughs> decided that the most important story to focus on wasn't new spy powers using fear of Muslims. It wasn't water being polluted and poisoning 4,000. It wasn't even the KiwiSaver investing in cluster bombs, tobacco and nukes. Oh no. It wasn't that our child poverty has now reached the Guardian or that people are now offering to rent out driveways to sleep. And this week, the New Zealand Herald decided an important political story was how many ties John Key has. You heard that correctly. The Herald breathlessly reported that the Prime Minister thinks he has somewhere between 200 and 500 ties. On the day he said this, he was wearing a paisley patterned pink tie and he said that the day after, he'd be wearing, wearing a blue polka dot tie. It's journalism like this, folks, that means we can't get nice things like a properly functioning fourth estate that holds the powerful to account. Ties, ladies and gentlemen. That's the big story of the week in the Herald. John Key's bloody ties. Thank you, panellists. Thank you for watching Fano. We'll join you Monday, 7pm next week for Wātia Fifth Estate. Kia ora. Good night. Watia Fifth Estate, brought to you by Voyager Internet. Call them on 0800 4Speed.